thank you professor ahmed for your kind introduction it is a it's very kind of you and uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers uh, for putting such a very nice conference together online such a difficult period and uh, my workshop organizers professor ahmed uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share our data so let me share my presentation so here you can see the title of my talk perovskite solar cells the road towards the commercialization so since i have mentioned the road towards commercialization um implies that we do have a materials um which are uh, highly efficient and stable that's what you will see in my presentation so i'm working at epfl i also have a affiliations at king abdul aziz university korea university south korea um this is my email address so on the bottom you can see whenever you have a questions or queries uh, please send me i will try to respond as soon as possible um this is our campus it's a very nice beautiful campus um, on the on the on the shores of the lake lemo and the other side we have a alp mountains and the campus is very beautiful so now if you look at the uh, just let me just take the presenter yeah so take the perovskite solar cell and compare silicon solar cell efficiencies perovskite solar cell efficiencies 25.5 has been certified and the similar tone silicon solar cells efficiencies are 26% efficiency the the gap between the efficiency between the silicon solar cells and perovskite solar cells is closing very closing but however if you look at the energy payback time for silicon solar cells it's going to be in years compared to few months for the perovskite solar cells this is mostly because of the energy intensive technology of the silicon solar cells where you have to have a high temperature processes on the contrary the perovskite solar cells are solution process and the required temperatures are in the range of 120 to 150 degrees temperature and the fact they are solution process makes them um the high throughput so you can produce in a bigger quantities and in a high throughput so that you can satisfy the market conditions so this is the, these are the solar cells which i am going to talk and these perovskite materials are beautiful materials they absorb uh, all the visible light so that they can generate carriers now you inject the carriers into the material and then you can you can see the corresponding emission coming from this material and this is very interesting the topic which we can discuss later so the take home message perovskite solar cells are very good absorbers for solar cell applications very good light emitting materials for light emitting diodes what are the perovskite materials and if you look at the perovskite structure this is a three dimensional perovskite structure having typically abx3 formula a is a either inorganic organic cation b is a lead tin but we focus only lead because of the stability of lead 2 plus tin 2 plus is not very stable in the periodic table so tin two, uh, lead 2 plus is more stable so we focus on the lead 2 plus now we have a halides bromide chloride iodide in the beginning everybody got quite excited to tune the spectral properties of this material by changing the halide composition but unfortunately what happens is when you have a mixed halides in the long run when you shine the light these halides are segregating and forming within the perovskite composition bulk a different perovskites higher energy perovskites and low energy perovskites in between you have a mixture of components so this is the drawback of um, this mixed halide perovskites so the take home message based on our experience and knowledge uh, try to focus on only a single halide if you want to have a, a low band gap material focus on the iodide and if you want to have a high band gap material focus on the bromide so one halide uh, avoids a segregation problem so this particular material have a very interesting properties which are highlighted on the bottom you see that these are the three uh, strong points which are highlighted the strong light absorption the whole visible region you will see the next slide um that absorption spectra spans between 400 nanometers to 820 nanometers and the band gap you can tune as i mentioned before but tuning this band gap has a disadvantages but in any case it gives you the opportunity to change its uh, properties and its color the other more important and pertinent point is the small excitation dissociation energy so it is as low as 
30 million electron volts. In other words, when you shine the light, the material takes a photon and it immediately creates the carriers. The carriers are diffused to the contacts. So this is the beauty of this material. And as, it showed, as I mentioned before, the spectral properties are shown on the left panel. The absorption factor spans between 400 to 800 nanometers, meaning absorbing all the visible light that creates you the carriers. And another interesting property of this material is, um, see here, the, I'm comparing uh, gallium arsenide versus uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskite versus uh, single crystal silicon solar cells. The onset is very sharp, and this suggests a well ordered microstructure and low trap density is another characteristic feature of this material. Using this type of material, um, in different labs, um, people are, are reached 24%, 25.5% .5 efficiency has been certified, but in our lab, uh, we recently uh, certified 23.5 plus or minus 0.75, and in the lab we get 24.2% efficiency. And the short circuit current using this material where we are using um, a formidinium lead iodide, pure iodide, without any bromide composition, that gives you 25.3 milliamp short circuit current. The VOC is 1.1, fill factor is very high. And the fill factor is very high, it's because of the the compositional engineering of the materials, that, that's what we are using, that you will see in my, uh, as we progress in our, in our slides. You can increase the size of this. The size of here is a 0 0.08. And here we can increase the size of the solar cells between 6.5 to 7 centimeters. So the efficiency is slightly decreased, 17.33. So this, has, this, this, uh, this work appeared in advanced energy materials this year. So you can have a, a mini modules using this type of materials. And you can change the colors by changing the halides uh, in the long run, whether it's useful or not. But here you have a bromide perovskite and mixed bromide and halide perovskite and the different levels of iodide substitution substituted with the bromide. You can also use for the plastic substrates. So building integrated applications with the colored uh, materials and flexible substrates it can be very nice material. So now with this background, there are issues with the perovskite material. That's the stability. How can we improve the stability of these materials? So here is the outline of my presentation. So we can change this material stability by interface engineering, point number one. The second point is that the compositional engineering of perovskite layers. So the way you are the making your perovskite composition you will see in my presentation. So that's what we call compositional engineering of perovskite layers. In the perovskite, in the first slide, when I showed you, you have a two charge transport layers. One is the electron transport layer, other, other one is the cold transporting material. So these charge transport materials has a vital role to play the stability of the perovskite solar cells. You will see in my presentation how we are addressing these charge transport materials um, uh, properties. So now coming back to the perovskite, within the perovskite, again, we have a different dimensionalities. So the perovskite, which we have discussed so far as a three-dimensional perovskite, which absorbs the whole visible region between 400 to 820 nanometers, as I discussed before. Here, the cation size is very important. If the cation goes into these uh, cavities, then the three-dimensional perovskite is more stabilized. However, if you increase the size of this cation, then you slice this three-dimensional perovskite into different dimensions. Now, depending on your ratio of this bigger cation versus smaller cations, now you can control the dimensionality of these perovskites. Here are a couple of examples which I have shown. Um, so this is the n equals to one layer where you have a larger cation. Um, and here is n equals to two where you have a smaller cation and the larger cation is uh, similarly, you have a n equals to three. What are these larger cations? Here I have given on the right side uh, some examples. n butylamine this is a larger cation compared to methyl ammonium. Iso, uh, uh, butyl ammonium, and you have a phenylamine, and you have a fluoroethylamine, sorry, fluoro, fluoroethylamine, and you have a ABA. All these type of cations can be used for the two-dimensional perovskite. And here, you get a lot of opportunities to tune these cations further um, to make these cations as a possible absorber also. So this will be, a, for example, if any a student wants to focus on the tuning of these cations, this can be a very nice project. 
So here I mentioned three-dimensional perovskite, but the problem with the two-dimensional perovskite is the spectral properties are not as, um, as broad as the three-dimensional perovskite. The stability of the two-dimensional perovskite is extremely high. On the contrary, the stability of three-dimensional perovskites are lower. So can we combine these three-dimensional perovskite and two-dimensional perovskite so that you can have a, both uh, the good properties of the three-dimensional perovskite, that's a light absorption, and the stability of the two-dimensional perovskites. That's what you will see in next few slides. Here is the one example. A pure two-dimensional perovskite I mentioned, it absorbs only a portion of the light, that's around 500 nanometers. And here you, have, you are seeing a three spectral properties, that's a pure two-dimensional perovskite. The black line is pure uh, two dimensional, sorry, three dimensional perovskite. And the red line is a two dimensional perovskite deposited on the top of three dimensional perovskite. So, how do we know actually we are having this layer by layer deposition? So, just take the XRD spectral properties of this material. So, if you look at the two pure two dimensional perovskite, the characteristic finger uh, point, uh, the, uh, the position is around five, uh, two theta. And if you look at the three-dimensional perovskite, you have a around a 14. Now, if you take the uh, mix, that's a two-dimensional perovskite deposited on the three-dimensional perovskite, you have a two-dimensional perovskite characteristic peak as well as three-dimensional characteristic peak. It's not only that one. You can also interrogate by photoluminescence studies. Now, since you are having a two-dimensional perovskite on the top, when you excite from the top side of this material, where we have a layered perovskite, three-dimensional followed by the two-dimensional, when you excite from the top side, what we are doing is we are exciting only the two-dimensional perovskite. Correspondingly, you will see the emission coming from the two-dimensional perovskite. That's around 500 nanometers. And if you look at the blank, that's a without any two-dimensional perovskite, excite same wavelength, that's a black line. You see purely three-dimensional perovskite is emitting. There is no two-dimensional perovskite. If you try to interrogate from the bottom side, excite from the glass side, so it shows the two, that's a reference sample, without any layered perovskite, and the layered perovskite, they are overlapping. So what's the information you are extracting? So based on these studies, you can clearly say that the two-dimensional perovskite is only deposited on the top. It's a layer by layer deposition it's neither penetrating or reaching towards the bottom as demonstrated from the, by exciting from the bottom side. So this information is very clearly demonstrated. We have a layered by layered perovskite. Using the inf this information, you just measure the um, UPS data. Using UPS data, you can build the, your energy level scheme. So this is the mixed cation uh, and the halide perovskite energy level scheme. And if you look at the two dimensional perovskite energy level scheme is shown here. So the, the homo level of the three-dimensional perovskite, the homo level of the two-dimensional perovskite are well aligned. Now, what happens when you shine the light, you create carriers, and then the positive charges are, since the whole, uh, the, the homo of the two-dimensional perovskite is well aligned with the three-dimensional perovskite. So there is no barrier to extract positive charges, holes into spiromatter, the so-called transporting material. On the contrary, the lowest occupied molecular LUMO Level of, the, level of the two dimensional perovskite is quite high compared to the three dimensional perovskite. So the electrons, they come, they bang is there. And since they cannot tunnel, so they go back towards the ETL layer. In other words, what we have created here is channeling of positive charges on the one direction and negative charges on the other direction. Okay, what is it giving us the benefit? So look at the IV characteristics. So this is the blank, the VOC of Without two-dimensional perovskite, 1.09. The short circuit current is 21 milliamps. The power conversion efficiency, 18.65%. The moment we put this two-dimensional perovskite, that's called layer perovskite. So what happens, the VOC is increased from 1.09 to 1.14. This increase in VOC is a direct result of reduced recombination on this interface. So that means we have reduced the recombination by creating, by inserting this two-dimensional perovskite, and that resulted high increase the VOC. And similarly, small increase in the short circuit current and the efficiency has increased slightly. This is based on phenyl ethyl amine. And now you can imagine several cations like uh, here is, yes, well, let me just give you the 
uh, benefit of this uh, two-dimensional perovskites. On the right side, what we are seeing is um, the stability data measured over the period of 800 hours. The blank lines are the perovskite solar cells. Let's say red one is the uh, two-dimensional perovskite solar cell deposited on the three-dimensional perovskite measured under argon condition. That's a blank um, squares under encapsulated, but under measured under normal conditions and under that is a filled space. And similarly, without any two-dimensional perovskite measured, uh, let's say open circles under argon atmosphere condition, under sealed encapsulated under normal condition, you can see the efficiency is decreasing. So this perovskite materials by depositing this layer, so we are automatically increasing the stability of the perovskite solar cells. As I mentioned before, that's not the limit of phenylethylamine. So now the whole chemistry is open for, for the scientists to, to imagine. Here are the two examples, even though we have several, I'm taking two examples, fluorophenylethylamine, just to focus on this one, you have an ethyl group. And now I'm taking another cation, this is a perfluorinated methyl amine. So the gap here is two methyl groups and here we have only one CH2 group. Corresponding absorption spectral properties you can see this is a fluorophenylethylamine is more redshifted absorption spectral point of view and perfluorophenylmethylamine, that's a slightly blue shifted. It's the same configuration like before, we deposit three-dimensional perovskite. And here I have to repeat once again that our three-dimensional perovskite composition has a 5% excess of lead iodide. So now when we deposit these cations on the top of three-dimensional perovskites, we do form this layered perovskite and that you can monitor by XRD. So that's what we see from the spectral properties point of view. Now, I just take you directly to the power conversion efficiency. So if you look at the, uh, the three-dimensional perovskite as a reference sample, the power conversion efficiency, 20% efficiency, the VOC 1.09. The moment we deposited um, this fluorophenylethylamine uh, two-dimensional perovskite, you can see the power conversion efficiency increased from 20% to 21.31. The VOC, as I mentioned before, from 1.09 to 1.13 volts. And similarly, the per perfluorinated one increased further compared to uh, fluorophenylethylamine, that's a 1.15. And the final power conversion efficiency is 21.65. So the other interesting properties again here is shown so you have an initial drop of all the perovskite solar cells. This is a different reason. But once if we have a, this initial burn-off period, and then we have a very stable performance with respect to two-dimensional perovskite deposited using perfluorinated cation compared to fluorophenylethylamine compared to without any 2D perovskites. So this is the beauty of um, interface engineering. Now I come back to the, the compositional engineering of these materials. So if you look at the different cations, methylamine, you have a two atoms, carbon and nitrogen, forbidinium three atoms, guanidinium four. What is the limit of the size of this cation to fit into this cavity? So if you look at here, so this is a, the 3D perovskite zone between one and 0.8. And any cation size which goes beyond this level one, then you slice this three-dimensional perovskite into uh, layered perovskites. The two small cations also will not give you a result to you the uh, nice perovskite material. So using this uh, combination of methylamine, that's a smaller cation, and a very big cation, guanidinium, any particular ratio, for example, here, the theoretically predicted uh, the right composition was 75% of methylammonium, 25% of guanidinium. When you have uh, this composition in your mixture, and that gives you the power conversion efficiency, uh, close to 20% efficiency. This work was sub, uh, reported in 2017. Now the efficiencies have gone up significantly. At that time, 20% is quite remarkable. But the beauty of this guanidinium is shown here on the bottom, the D line. So the black line is a reference sample and the efficiency is decreasing over the period of 1,100 hours. The moment we have a 12%, 14% guanidinium in it, it's a slightly improved compared to the, uh, the blank. The moment we have a 25% of this guanidinium cation, 
So you can increase significantly the stability of this, uh, the mixed cation perovskite using molybdenum around 25%. So this is a compositional engineering of cations. So we can also do um, the compositional engineering by incorporating the ionic liquids. So I have, even though we have a several ionic liquids, I'm taking only the two examples. One is, is shown here. This one has a, a particularly a aliphatic chain with the fluorinated functional groups. So this was a, with the purpose we have designed this ionic liquid. The spectral properties are shown on the right side, the absorption factor and emission, not big differences, even though you have a, a reference sample, 1%, 2%, 4%, the spectral properties slightly change, but not significant uh, difference to, to discuss. But however, if you look at the unreacted lead iodide, which is shown here, that's around 12.7. And if you don't have any of uh, this uh, ionic liquid, the peak is a very prominent. Now, if you add 1% of ionic liquid, this excess lead iodide is decreasing significantly and going to 2% further decreases, going to 4%, is further decreasing. So that means, so this ionic liquid um, is preventing the formation of lead iodide from your perovskite. So that indirectly enhancing your st stability of the perovskite materials. And here is another example to show how this 1% uh, ionic liquid um, is stabilizing our perovskite solar cells material even outside two months in the ambient air with a 50% humidity this on the left side, what we are seeing is a reference without ionic liquid. You can see the color is disappeared completely. On the right side, front side and back side, the color is almost intact when we have a even 1% ionic liquid. That demonstrates the compositional engineering of perovskite enhances uh, the stability significantly. I take one more example so that the students can get inspiration from this, the design concepts. Here is a Another ionic liquid, let me just show you the ionic liquid. Sorry. Yeah, so this is the ionic liquid. So it's a benzyl, uh, uh, benzyl imidazolium ionic liquid with the vinyl groups on the two sides, so which I am highlighting here. And the another one is a um, similar one, but without any double bonds. So these are the ionic liquids. Now I go back. So here is the ionic liquid, using this ionic liquid, even though methyl ammonium lead iodide is uh, not very stable material, you can make this um, ionic liquid containing perovskite solar cell outside. So let me explain you the, what is the beauty of this material. When we have these uh, polyneuromizable ionic functional groups, when you deposit, put into the perovskite composition, after depositing heating at 120 degrees temperature, this ionic liquid self polymerizes and it gives you the very nice uh, layer on the top of the perovskites. So, if you look at the efficiency, 15%, it increases to 17%. And now, if you change the composition from methyl ammonium, pure methyl ammonium lead iodide, to mixed cation perovskite, the efficiency increases from 17 to 19% efficiency. So, now the question is. Um, if, if, can we increase the stability of this material? So here is the stability data measured over the period of 2000 hours. So with the polymerizable ionic liquid, the efficiency remains over 90% compared to unpolymerizable ionic liquid, which we have added, and the efficiency decreases significantly. So with uh, this one, I just quickly go to the charge transfer materials. Um, so if you look at the whole transport material, this is the one of the critical component in the perovskite solar cells. The spiro and PTA are the two main um, the working horses for these perovskite solar cells. The problem with the spiro is the stability um, and the mobility. So this can be improved by using um, by dopants. So here is particularly cobalt three complexes. You, when we use, what we do is we oxidize um, whole transporting material intrinsic uh, uh, whole transporting material into uh, conducting whole transporting material. In addition to cobalt addition, we also use a lithium TFSI as well as tertiary butyl pyridine as dopants. So that gives you again um, a decreased hydrophobicity. That means that uh, it's a, it's prone to have a hygroscopic attack. In addition, when we have these tertiary butyl groups, 
by the way, you can see detailed mechanism in this publication, which is published in 2018. The pyridine, um, it also acts as a nucleic agent onto this carbazole type of uh, uh, sub, um, um, organic moieties, and then it changes its property. So the idea is, can we develop whole transporting materials which are dopant free? So here is the concept. If we have a, a type of molecules, which are a disc, and then we have a three arms with the thiophene groups. So on the end, we put the different acceptor groups. Here is the dioxygen groups. Here is sulfur and oxygen group. Here we have a dicyanide groups. So just remember B1, B2, B3. And B3 gives us very comparable efficiency. And look at the IPC spectra. Um, the, the red one is the spiral attack. The red squares are the spiral attack. The green one is uh, B3 which is almost comparable to the spirometer. With respect to IV characteristics and the red and green, that's a spirometer and the newly developed molecule, they are overlapping. But the difference here between the spiro and the new molecule is spiro is completely doped and the new molecule is undoped. So the efficiencies are shown here. Um, B3 gives very close to 18% efficiency comparable to the spirometer, which is 18.02. But if you look at the stability data, um, the spirometer initial burn-off is as usual. We have a strong burn-off and then followed by continuous decrease. That's it. I'm comparing only the spirometer versus B3. And the B3 is initially we are increasing. This is understandable because uh, we are creating positive charges and the mobility is increasing and that goes on. And then the stability is, is relatively better than the spirometer. Now I come to the uh, other chart transport layer, that's a ETL. Um, we have developed this type of uh, new compounds, uh, estral esternate based ones. So using this estral esternate uh, type of bilayer configurations, uh, we did report 22% efficiency, which was certified again at Newport, measured uh, under similar conditions. Uh, so these efficiencies were reported in 2019, last year, and this now this year we are having 23.5% efficiency. But however, if we look at the, uh, the stability, the interface between the perovskite and then the ETL layer, look at that when you have a TAO2 as an ETL layer, the stability is decreasing significantly. However, if you have a pure tin oxide, that's a red dot, which is overlapping significantly with the blue, blue dots, and the blue dots are TO2 bilayer, TO2 on the top of tin oxide. So in other words, we have manipulated the ETL layer, stability, the stability of this interface by incorporating two bilayer uh, ETL layers. With that one, I come to the conclusions. So the take home messages, the 2D and 3D composite delivers an exceptional gradually organized multi-dimensional structure that are very stable. A new perovskite composition based on combination of vanadium and methylammonium cations exhibits superior photovoltaic performance and stability. Hydrophobic ionic liquids, uh, I briefly mentioned the two ionic liquids that enhances stability of perovskite solar cells. We have developed dopant-free HTMs compared to, to spiral. And followed by, I have here the list of people, uh, PhD students and the postdocs and collaborations with the other groups. And this is my group. And I thank you for your attention. My time is 30 minutes exactly. Uh, I will be happy to answer your questions either now or at the later stage. Thank you.